just put four bitches at four seats. Money made me forget I got amnesia. <laughs> Hey, what's going on guys? Skogi here and I'm back with a brand new video for you all today. And today we are doing an album review, which I haven't done on this channel in this format anyway. So I've done album reactions and done like a little review afterwards and just said what I thought about every song and I've done song reactions. I, I haven't done a proper review though where I sit with something for a while and really delve deep into what I'm thinking about so I wanted to do that I've been wanting to do that since I started the channel actually originally I planned on doing an album review every week and then just doing song reactions uh, during the week but um, instead I ended up just kind of throwing my everything into the song reactions I did a couple vlogs vlogs are coming back soon by the way but um, so this is gonna be my first album review and we're listening and today we're talking about Billie Eilish, When We All Fall Asleep, Where Do We Go? So the first I ever heard of Billie Eilish, I heard the uh, Don't Smile At Me EP. And when I heard that for the first time, I wasn't completely impressed, but I was very, very interested. The, uh, the high singing with the trap drums and synth pads and big bass patterns like I, I really really liked so songs like I don't want to be you anymore and copycat I really really liked everything else I like I thought it was okay but nothing really hit me like I wanted it to and honestly I haven't even gone back and listened to these songs since listening to it a little bit for the first few times maybe I should go give them a chance again but either way I was kind of underwhelmed but I was very excited to see what came out next and, amazingly enough, the next album was the one we're reviewing now, When We All Fall Asleep, Where Do We Go? I mean, I'd heard some of the singles before the album came out, and it all sounded like it was going in a great direction, and it did. I absolutely loved this album. The reason that I decided to do a review of it was because it's the only album so far this year that I've connected with in any sort of way. Everything else, like, there might have been one or two good songs, but there was nothing that I really wanted to go back and listen to all the time. And being that we're four months through this year already, it really caught me off guard that a pop album would be the only one that I loved. Some people, they just aren't interested by vocals. Like, they don't care if you're a good singer or not. They just want to hear the tune of the song, and, like, if you can hit the easy notes, you can make a good song. Billie Eilish can really reach out of her comfort zone and hit some crazy, crazy high notes, and I really, really appreciate that. I don't know why, I just, I love hearing people hit like high whistle notes and stuff like that in their music. It's part of the reason I loved, I love Ariana Grande so much. I really, really appreciate good singing. And hearing that kind of stuff over the production that I like, like really bouncy, heavy, uh, in your face uh, drum and bass patterns, I, I love. And the highest points on this album and on her EP Copycat are just that. Really, really high notes on top of crazy, crazy synth and drum patterns. So the album starts off with this. Uh, skit it's just a bunch of exclamation points and she says I've taken out my Invisalign which is like a, like a clear like braces type thing that uh, helps fix your teeth so I guess she had to take it out to sing better but um, I don't know I didn't really understand why they put this on the front of the album I mean maybe if you're a, a Billie Eilish stan you see the humor and why she'd want to put that but um I don't know, I, I kind of wish it wasn't there, or if it was, like, just put it on the front of Bad Guy, I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have made it its own track, but either way, it does kind of set the tone for a really goofy, intimate setting. Uh, you can tell, like, she's very comfortable with uh, the person, the producer here, who is actually her older brother, who produced and 
made this album happen pretty much. I don't know all the specifics of everything, but um, I know that he had a big part in making the album. That's the other voice you hear. Then it jumps into Bad Guy, which um, I reacted to Bad Guy on the channel here. I absolutely love that song so, so much. It's great. Right off the bat on the album, one of my favorite songs comes on. It's like, it's super sticky, like the beat is just so, the beat is just so sticky. Like as soon as you hear that, like I just want to go back and listen to it again immediately. As soon as it turns off, I want to listen to it again. What most impressed me about this song wasn't just the sticky pop pattern, because a lot of pop songs have sticky patterns. It's that she was able to let that darker side of herself peek through with the um, the weird voice effect on the hook where she says bad guy and it gives you that kind of creepy eerie feeling in the middle of all this fun wacky stuff and I think that's a perfect tone setter for this album. That being said, I think it was a huge misstep to put Zanny right after that song. Because I, I appreciate what she's trying to do with the lyrics of the song, but if you're trying to appeal to these younger people in like that fun way, like a lot of them have fallen victim to the thing that you're talking about here, and it just comes off very pretentious to not recognize that the people stuck in the cycle of like the people stuck in that cycle of doing drugs and like they they don't care they don't feel like yeah they don't feel because they don't want to and it's a rough terrible cycle to get into but dehumanizing them in the way that she does in the song isn't a good way to help them and I I don't know it just it threw me off first thing listening to the album to hear that because I would have expected a different perspective from her. You know, like the old thing in the Bible of the sin or not the sin. You gotta help that person out, not shun them. But, um, I should say the production and singing on the song, I do like. And, um, if I could get past what she was saying, I'm sure I would like the song a lot, but I just can't. Then after that, you hear a low, a low rumble come on, and that's the start of You Should See Me in a Crown, which is another one of my favorites on the album. It, the beat, while it's broken down, is really droning, but not in your face. It's a very low, dull, like, you can almost hardly hear it. It's sort of like a lullaby, but it builds anticipation so well as she starts talking about this story of uh, a guy hitting on her and it's like eh, you're not worth it though if you think i'm pretty now you should see me in a crown and when she says crown it all bursts out and you hear the big bass and trap drum patterns that made me interested in her in the first place it's one of the most satisfying bass drops in music period in my opinion it's just great to hear but like as soon as that all ends you go back into a verse and it's back into that lullaby thing it's she's singing so slowly it feels like the words are falling out of her mouth and again it just helps build that anticipation to hear another hook and it's just such a satisfying song to listen to and then you're thrown into All the Good Girls Go to Hell, which is one of the more basic songs on this whole album. Uh, not very much stuck out about it to me, other than the fact that when she's singing it, it sounds like she's being like hugged really tightly from behind. And like she, she almost can't breathe and get her words out, but it's still sung well. And it is catchy, it's just you need to get past that delivery at first. I don't know, it just seems like a little bit of filler. That being said, whenever it comes on, I do have that all oh, the good girls go to hell stuck in my head all day. The next song is another one that I kind of struggled with, kind of like Zanny. I liked how it was sung, and production-wise, it probably is my favorite on the album, but it's just a little 
odd why she would make the song the way that she did. It seems like from the title of it and just the way that she says some of the lyrics in the song, it feels like she's supposed to be talking from the perspective of somebody inside the LGBTQ community. And then there are other lines where it seems like she's trying to also make it clear, like, oh no, I'm talking about a straight person here. And it just seems like a very obvious kind of... It, it seems like she's trying to mislead people into thinking that this song is some sort of, like, anthem for an LGBTQ person, but... Um, instead, it, it just kind of lacks content, period. I do get the sentiment of, I wish you were gay because it would give me a reason that you don't like me, but it's also kind of a shitty reason, <laughs> and it's just a weird thing to, to write about. I don't know if I'm overthinking it. She is young, it could have just been what she was thinking. I don't I don't know if she meant and intended to mislead people, but um, it, it happened and I've definitely seen other people complain about that and the song got a little bit of buzz for that reason. And I like the track regardless, it's just, I don't know. Again, I don't exactly know how to feel about that. Now, When the Party's Over is very, very important for the flow of the album. It begins this kind of descent into madness where she really shows the more introspective and sad reality that uh, she's living and it kind of gets away from the bouncy fun stuff more. Well there still is bouncy fun stuff throughout the rest of the album, uh, this song very much is a turning point. The intro comes on and it's a chorus of very high-pitched hums. I assume that she did all of them. And it gives me chills, gives me goosebumps when I hear those hums come on. And again, her voice just matches perfectly with the entire tone of the song. And again, it feels like the words are falling out of her mouth because it's, there's just so much anticipation you want to hear what she's about to say and just coming in on that really emotional don't you know I'm no good for you like it pushed me over the edge and brought a tear to my eye the first time I heard it. This song actually really reminds me of Adele um, except it lacks a really big climax like a lot of Adele songs have. Instead, it gets to the part where you feel like there's supposed to be a payoff and there's a little bridge and then it slows back down. And I really like the bridge. I could lie, say I like it like that. I like it like that. But, and it's, it's very simple. It gets the point across of I could lie to you and say that I'm okay, but I'm not. It's when you're struggling in a relationship and stuff isn't going right, but you still want to be together and you might want to try to pretend you're happy, but you just aren't. It's one of those things where you really hear that this album is the perspective of a 17 year old. Like, I'm 19 now. I remember doing, I remember going through some of these same feelings being 14, 15. Like, a lot of the stuff that she's writing about happened as a teenager, and it happens to a lot of teenagers. You can relate even if you're not going through it right now. And it's it's weird to hear that perspective in music because a lot of the artists that you hear from and that are that big and popular are older. So it was a nice shift and I really liked that. Or the people that are our age that are big in music aren't talking about the stuff that really matters to them like that because it's hard to be vulnerable when you're young. Anyway, I absolutely love this cut so much. Unfortunately, it leads into the worst song by far on the album, Eight, which I can only presume is called that because she sounds eight year old with that 
stupid high-pitched vocal effect that they put on it. It's honestly terrible. Like, towards the middle, it kind of sounds more like a singer-songwriter kind of like YouTube, you that yeah, YouTube, YouTube ukulele musician kind of thing going on. And I do like that part in the middle, but I, I can't get past the pitch change at the front of the song. It sounds really dumb. So that just, it really took me out of the album completely. And if it wasn't here, I feel like this album would be much stronger for it. And I would say that the only thing that took me even further out of the emotion of this album was hearing Michael Scott at the beginning of My Strange Addiction. And honestly, if she had kept the Office references to just that first part where he says, no Billy, I haven't done that dance since my wife died, I would understand. Like, he says Billy, it fits in with the album, and then like, yeah, put on this awesome song that's gonna make you want to dance because I do love this song I love it so much I'm working on a remix I love it that much that chorus or that pre-chorus the, the bad bad news one of us is gonna lose I'm the powder you're the fuse just add some friction that is hilarious and I love it this song, it just has too many people talking. I don't want to hear Jim and Kevin and, like, I don't want to hear these Office characters talking throughout the song. Like, the first few times I heard the song, it kind of made me laugh and it was whatever, but at this point, I just don't want to hear it anymore. But then again, it's also my favorite song on the album, so it's kind of hard for me to decide what I want to do with it. I don't know, I want to hear a, a remix without that kind of stuff in it, and I don't know, maybe put another artist on it. I want to hear more. I want to hear features too. There's no features on this album. I wish there was something in the realm of a feature, but who knows. After that song, you get Bury a Friend, which in a way is kind of like a title track. Um, it does have the title in it, though. When we all fall asleep, where do we go? I feel like Bury a Friend was probably intended to be the album's title up until very late in production, if I had to guess. That is completely just guessing, but um, I feel like it would make a little bit of sense. And, like, there's not a crazy amount of, like, experimental or different things about this song, it's just a lot of different catchy phrases packed front to back. And honestly, like, any line in this song could get stuck in your head. Any line at all. So while it's perfect for a lead single, and it sounds good, it just isn't like anything you'd really want to stop time for. That being said, the hook of why aren't you scared of me, why do you care for me, all of that, it feels like if you took the Descent Into Madness that I was talking about and shrunk it down into four bars, you pretty much get the whole album in the four lines of the hook here. After that you have Ilo Milo, which I again reacted to on the channel. I think the song has a very similar problem to All the Good Girls Go to Hell, where it almost sounds like she's being squeezed too tight and doesn't want to get the words out. Like, a, it's a very breathy delivery, and I don't think it needed to be that breathy. But the little refrain of, like, where did you go? No, 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 and I don't wanna be lonely. Like, that, that can't help but get stuck in your head. And, um,. It's a very short song, it doesn't overstay its welcome, it's only two and a half minutes long. So, I just, I, I keep wanting to hear that refrain over and over and over and over. And, um, this album, just all together, is great at creating an earworm and making you want to go back and click it again. Now, from there, you're not really allowed to be happy for the rest of the album. She starts this song off by kind of setting the stage uh, that she's up on a rooftop getting ready to jump off and she's saying to this person who has hurt her 
and caused her to do this, like, hey, this is your last chance to talk to me, because I'm done. And, um, it's, it's very, very, very dark. I feel wrong listening in on this conversation that somebody's having, like, I shouldn't, I, it's not for me to hear. And then she goes into the salty tears on my cheek, it's what a year-long headache does. I can't imagine having a stress headache so bad that you're literally crying constantly. Like, I've had stress headaches, they're the worst. I have cried from a stress headache, but I have never gotten to the point where it's just... Every time I've had a problem, even similar to that, I've been able to overcome it and deal with it in some way after. I think a couple of weeks was the worst time. Even if it comes back and you have to deal with it again, it's never been like a full year of just dealing with it. And I can see how that would be exhausting. And now we have I Love You, which it has a little guitar riff as the main line of the song. And honestly, I've heard the same or similar done so many times, that exact little guitar flutter thing. Lil Wayne did it on his album in the song Mess, it sounds pretty much just like that. The song goes back to the thing that I was saying about like being a kid, like um, dropping that bomb of I love you too soon on somebody you probably don't really mean that for, or whatever it could be. Um, I've made that mistake, <laughs> like I think a lot of people have, and it really is gut-wrenching like you feel like such a fucking idiot when you do that the only thing is about this song because I do really like it and like that content hit me and I feel it I wish it had switched places with listen before I go transitioning from this mistake into the suicide note-esque of listen before I go would have been better and it would have kept the album off better if you ended on that Instead, it, it kind of makes the song here and the last song that comes after it just seem totally skippable. It, it feels like the album is capped off at Listen Before I Go, and then there are two more songs that are just kind of random. I feel like it would have flowed a lot better if you had put that first. And the song Goodbye, I don't think needed to be there at all. At all. It's just a really reverby. I don't even know. It, it, like, the beat exists solely to. solely for a tempo. Like, there's nothing entertaining going on in the instrumental, and she's just taking some of the phrases throughout her album that are the most sad and throwing them all into one song. I don't understand why it's here or what it's supposed to do for the album, but um, I think the album would have been much better if it had ended with Listen Before I Go and this song could have just stayed off of it completely. I, I love this album because I love the idea of starting off with that goofball side of yourself, like trying to show like what you have to offer and everything, and it's like a dark humor, and then eventually growing tired of like hiding behind that. Eventually it feels like she grew tired of hiding behind the fun stuff and dropped back into how she really feels. I think it's a great concept for an album, and it's why I love this album so much. I just feel like it could have done, been done a little bit better. Overall, just with how many songs I loved on this album, I'm giving this album a 7.5 out of 10. I just, like I said, I wish it could have been sequenced a little bit differently, and I think there are some unnecessary things on there. But um, that being said, nothing's perfect I guess and she's still really new to making music like I said she's 17 she's really young stuff's only gonna get better from here and I can't wait to hear it Billy I'm a huge fan and I can't wait to hear more yeah that's all I have to say that, that's probably been a lot too I don't know how long this video is I don't know at all what the format's gonna be but um yeah that's gonna be it I love you all 
and I will see you in the next video. Later, everybody. Back from the bar, though, bumping Mac DeMarco. When the bar closed, the bar stools got barcodes. Quoting Fargo, shows in Park Slope. Withdrawal dough from Wells Fargo, Spark Dro. Key Largo, got no embargo. Puff a Cuban cigar, eat it as cargo. It's on the forks, you dorks, a dollar.